goes. All right, so as people uh, start uh, coming into the to, to this session, uh, we'll give the introduction. Good morning. Thank you for, uh, for joining us once again for Tipping Point, Connecticut's uh, Affordable Housing Conference. Um, many of you are coming from the keynote presentation, and uh, if you like the keynote presentation, I'm pretty sure you're going to like this uh, because these, these two presentations uh, both touch on similar themes of housing, education, and residential uh, segregation. Uh, my name is Charlie Shaddix. I'm the communications manager at the Partnership for Strong Communities. Throughout the week, we're hosting over 30 sessions featuring local, state, and national experts leading conversations that explore challenges, share best practices, and coalesce us around critical next steps to address key affordable housing issues in our state. Today's presentation is titled Separate and Unequal, The Interactive Effects of Housing and Education Policies on School Segregation in Connecticut. Uh, this session uh, features representatives from three great Connecticut organizations. We have from Connecticut Voices for Children, um, we have Whitney Dukes and Aaron Sheehan. Uh, they're going to discuss Connecticut Voices' latest report on the effects of housing and education policy on school segregation. Afterwards, Sarah Bronin from Desegregate Connecticut and Karen Bois walton from Elm City Communities will discuss how this research fits with their legislative priorities and provide actionable ways to get involved in their legislative agendas. There will also be a Q&A at the end of the presentation. Now, before we turn it over to our presenters, we'd like to thank our leading sponsors, the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority and the Melville Charitable Trust. Their support is crucial and it allowed this conference series to exist. So, uh, so hats off to both of them. Um, we'd also like to thank our collaborating sponsor, the Connecticut Department of Housing, and our supporting sponsors, Housing Enterprises Incorporated and Whittlesey. A couple of housekeeping notes before we start. Um, this session is being recorded and we will make all recordings available to conference attendees as soon as possible. All participants have entered muted. Please remain on mute unless a presenter has asked you to unmute. If you have a technology issue, uh, please select the chat icon in the Zoom control panel and send it in the chat to uh, myself at PSC Zoom Meetings 2. We will do our best to assist you. Your presenters will, know, will, let, will let you know how they would like content questions to be submitted. A few minutes before the end of the session, we will launch a poll that asks for your feedback on the session. Please take a minute to share and help us improve future webinars and conference offerings. Uh, finally, uh, you can, um, you can uh, join the conversation about Tipping Point at hashtag Tipping Point 2020 on Twitter and follow us at PSC, Housing, uh, at PSC Housing on Twitter if you aren't already. Lastly, the Partnership for Strong Communities is working to better understand the needs of our communities and affordable housing partners. We want to learn from you. Towards the end of the session, we'll be sharing a link to a survey and chat. Please take a few minutes after the session to share your feedback and shape both the issues we work on and the ways we work. I will now turn it over to our presenters to get us started. Okay, great, thank you so much. Um, Let's we'll just get the PowerPoint up and we'll get ready to go. Great, so um, hi everyone, um, we're so glad to be here today. Welcome to our panel, Separate and Unequal, the Interactive Effects of Housing and Education Policies on School Segregation in Connecticut. Um, like I said, we're really glad to be in conversation with you and with our partners in the housing and education spaces. We'll talk more about the work that they do shortly. My name is Whitney Dukes, I'm the Community Engagement Associate at Connecticut Voices for Children. Uh, to give you an overview of today, after our co-presenters introduce their work, uh, we'll talk more about the research that went into this share some of the data, uh, how we share that data and research with community members and talk about some of the policy recommendations that came out of it. Uh, so first, I'm so excited to introduce Dr. Karen DuBois Walton, uh, who is the president of Elm City Communities, the housing, Author city, housing authority of the city of New Haven, the Glendower Group and 360 Management Group, uh, where she's responsible for administrative, programmatic and policy direction of the public housing program and the housing choice voucher program. Uh, so she'll talk a bit more about her work in this space in a moment. Um, so welcome, Karen. Uh, we're really excited to have you join us today. Uh, and next is uh, Sarah Bronin, who is an architect, attorney, and professor who specializes in land use, historic preservation, and property law, and founded Desegregate Connecticut. Uh, she currently serves as an advisor to the Sustainable Development Code 
and the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Uh, so thank you, Sarah, for joining us today. Um, and lastly, I'll introduce my colleague, Erin Sheehan, uh, who's our legislation and data analyst with Connecticut Voices for Children, whose research uh, focuses primarily on access to affordable housing in Connecticut. Uh, so now I'll hand it off to uh, Dr. Karen Dubois Walton, who will get us started uh, to talk, share, share more of her work, and then we'll pass it off to uh, Sarah. Good morning. Thank you, Whitney. Um, thank you certainly to Connecticut Voices for um, being the lead on pulling us together and thank you to the partnership for uh, this opportunity to be a part of the Tipping Point. This has been a really amazing set of conversations and look forward to this one. Um, as Whitney shared, I am Karen DeVoice Walton. I serve as the president of Elm City Communities, which serves as the public housing authority for the city of New Haven. Through that, we operate the two primary um, federal programs around affordable housing, the low-income public housing program and the housing choice voucher program, both of which are essential in creating true access to affordable housing for families. Through those programs, families are sure to pay no more than 30% of their income, regardless of their income level, toward their housing costs. And what I hope to be able to talk with you a bit more today as I get into my presentation is uh, the many ways in which we have um, throughout time in this country blocked uh, those programs from working as effectively as they, as they could to allow housing op opportunities for families everywhere and instead have served to really segregate um, poverty and segregate uh, uh, families of color into certain communities. There's a path forward from here, uh, but I think we need to begin by being really rooted in the history that got us to this point so that we can then design public policy that will move us forward differently. So I look forward to talking to you more about that. Thank you, Whitney. I'm going to go over here from Sarah next. Hi, I'm having some technical difficulties. I don't know if you guys can see me or hear me. Yes, okay, yeah, great. Yeah. Um, I will switch over to my computer momentarily. Um, but, uh, you know, I'll be talking about uh, a little later just about the, um, the structure of uh, zoning and how that impacts uh, housing, I mean, how it impacts educational outcomes and maybe some of the surprising things um, that we've seen in the research, uh, sort of, you know, the, the, a lot of what we hear and we alluded to this in the last conversation um, is about how uh, the, the more multifamily housing you bring or the more um, uh, two, three, four uh, family housing uh, and multifamily housing you bring, the, the more kids, the more burden on the school system, uh, the higher the educational costs. Um, studies have shown that that's uh, simply not the case. It is the case, however, that more integrated uh, zoning, more integrated communities and more integrated schools are actually better outcomes for everybody. So the group that I um, have helped to start, which is called Desegregate Connecticut, is primarily about uh, zoning and land use reform. Um, you can find us online at desegregatect.org. Um, but I know that, uh, you know, one of the things we haven't talked so much about yet, um, which I'm happy to, to be part of the conversation today, is the link between housing and schools. So with that, I will um, stop there and turn it back over. Thank you so much, Karen and Sarah. Uh, so now we're going to walk through some of the research that we did at Voices surrounding housing and education segregation. Uh, you know, to open up this conversation a bit, we want to share more about the history of segregation in the state of Connecticut. As you all know, Connecticut is a very segregated state in a large part due to zoning regulations. So zoning regulations have a history of being built onto existing practices of segregation and racial discrimination used to control where black and brown populations can live. Uh, for examples of that, we can look at past practices like redlining, where government agencies and financial institutions used to control where black populations can live. Um, and we look at exactly as well as sorry, government agencies and financial institutions will take a map of an area and divide the map by who lived where. Um, areas that had mostly white populations um, were given access to whatever financial assistance they needed to invest in their communities. And areas that were mostly black, immigrant, and people of color communities were denied these services. Um, and also issues like blockbusting, the practice where realtors persuaded white homeowners to sell property cheaply out of fear that black and brown people moving into an area would cause, cause housing values to drop. Uh, so beyond redlining and blockbusting, early zoning ordinances explicitly banned, banned black people from living in certain parts of the cities, 
But when this practice was struck down by the Supreme Court, many cities started to promote single family zoning, meaning that only single family homes could be built. Uh, the purpose was to create certain areas with only single family homes that disproportionately lower income black people of color and immigrant families couldn't afford, effectively restricting people in areas zoned for cheaper multifamily housing or housing meant to house more than one family, like such as apartment buildings. Um, as we know since, that since education is funded primarily by local property taxes with black and brown families already restricted to undervalued, underfunded communities, this means less tax dollars for education, even if they have higher tax rates. Um, and where a person goes to school is determined by a school district drawn school attendance zones, which use factors like location and area demographics to determine where schools are built and which schools can attend, which school students can attend, sorry. Uh, because of this, school districts can reinforce school segregation through their own drawing of school zone boundaries and have the potential to increase, recreate, or decrease the underlying residential segregation of their areas. So Anne will talk a bit more about the specific data to back this up. Hi everyone, my name is Erin Sheehan. I'm a legislation and data analyst at Voices. So I'll be going over the data we collected that explores the relationship between housing segregation and segregated schools. The first set of data that we collected illustrates how more restrictive guidelines on the construction of multifamily housing consistently leads to more exclusionary neighborhoods with higher incomes, more funding for schools, and more white students. The specific restriction that I'm referring to here is the ease and ability to build multifamily housing. In our research, we divided towns up into three categories. First, multifamily housing allowed by right, which means that multifamily housing can be built anywhere without any special permits, as long as it fits into other zoning regulations like density and lot size requirements. Special permit required to build multifamily housing, which like it sounds means that special permits are required. And finally, multifamily housing not allowed, which means that nowhere in that zone can multifamily housing be constructed. We found that restrictions on the construction of multifamily housing has ongoing discriminatory effects. Towns with the most restrictive land use practices have less affordable housing than towns that allow multifamily housing. They have less student racial diversity, smaller student teacher ratios, larger, harder to afford minimum lot size requirements, higher per pupil funding, and higher median household incomes. This shows us that restrictive land use practices work to keep people of color out while keeping educational and economic resources in. We also looked at how these practices affect residential segregation within several Fairfield County towns. There are four primary reasons we chose to focus on Fairfield County. First, Fairfield County has some of the most racially imbalanced schools. Connecticut has a racial imbalance law, which states that schools can't have a minority enrollment substantially above or below the enrollment of minority students in the district overall. One in four school districts in Fairfield County have racial imbalances or impending racial imbalances. Second, the gap between rich and poor is largest in Fairfield County, and it's continuing to widen. Third, there's an ongoing conversation about exclusionary zoning policies in several Fairfield County towns. And finally, Fairfield County's population is consistently growing. And this will likely continue due to the COVID-19 pandemic with people leaving New York City for the New York City suburbs. For the sake of this presentation, I'm gonna be focusing on the data that we collected in Greenwich because Greenwich has the most racially imbalanced schools in the region. So the map that you see on the screen maps out the different zoning land use policies as well as the elementary school locations and the demographics of those schools. The shades of blue on the map represent zoning laws. Blue represents areas where single family housing is allowed and white represents areas where multifamily housing is allowed. The darker the shade of blue, the larger the minimum lot size, which means that housing is likely more unaffordable. Next, the circles on the map represent the elementary schools. The darker shades of purple represent larger numbers of black and brown students. Areas of the town that allow multifamily housing and have smaller lot sizes have the highest populations of black and brown students in their schools. While the inverse is true for the areas with the most exclusionary practices. So that's just a short overview of the data that we collected. With that data, we conducted a data walk where we shared the information with the community and Whitney will be discussing that further. 
Thank you, Erin. Uh, so part of what we did to share our findings with the community was to present our data to external stakeholders through what we call a, a community-centered data walk. Uh, we hosted our data walk via Zoom with up to 20 organizations doing housing and education work from across the state. Some of the organizations include Center for Children's Advocacy, New Haven Legal Assistance, Elm City Communities, Open Community Alliance, and Desegregate Connecticut, with a full list of organizations on the next slide. Uh, so we broke out into small groups to share our findings and help identify the work that's already happening across the state and really understand uh, more about who the experts were leading this work and learn from them what in our research is new to them and what data can be used to better support the work they're, do they're doing on a daily basis. Uh, so for this specific one, we work with stakeholders from the housing and education spaces and the information we've gathered here helped to inform our recommendations in the report, which Aaron will talk about shortly and help us think about more ways to center voices from the community in our work moving forward. Uh, we're also taking feedback on how we engage the community. Is our information accessible? Is it easy to digest? And are there more communities we need to be inviting to this conversation? Uh, so next, Erin will talk a bit more about how the po policy recommendations of the data walks help to inform. So like Whitney said, all of the discussion from the data walks is what we use to generate the policy recommendations. And they're focused on three main categories, solutions to increase access to affordable housing, improve our education system, and address other structural issues that continue to impact economic inequality. So first under the housing focused solutions with both Karen and Sarah will be talking about later on, we have three main recommendations. First, land use reform to expand housing diversity, increase affordable housing supply, and improve the processes that thwart new developments. Second, removing jurisdictional authority for public housing authorities. And third, strengthening Section 830G of the Connecticut General Statute. Next, under education-focused solutions, we also have three recommendations. First, continuing the push for regionalization, expanding access to regional pre-kindergarten centers, and identifying the school facilities that are underutilized or slated to close and repurposing them. And finally, under under structural issues that relate to economic inequality, three recommendations. First, creating a fair tax system that works for everyone. Next, raising the minimum wage. And finally, increasing opportunities for minority home ownership. So that's just a brief overview of the report that we recently released and how we got to the policy recommendations that we made. One of our goals in this space is to uplift the work of organizations in our coalition partners like Desegregate Connecticut and Elm City Communities who are doing great advocacy work in this area. So with that, I'll be handing the conversation over to Karen and Sarah to discuss their own policy priorities and how we can all support the work that they're leading. So I'm gonna start off by handing it over to Karen and she will discuss her work at Elm City Communities. Thank you so much, Erin. Going to go ahead and pull up my slides. Oops. So that hopefully all those will come up in one second. I don't know why it's being slow. Okay. Um, so uh, again, I really want to acknowledge and, and I um, appreciate being situated in this conversation. Um, one Monday's uh, keynote by Dr. Tiffany Manuel, I think really raised um, a, an important set of um, considerations for us around um, really being adaptive leaders in this, in this moment. Um, and then following today's keynote um, by Jackie Ray Thomas, um, and the work that she's done. I think it's just um, a really nice flow into the work that we've been doing. Some may ask sort of why as a public housing authority are we um, engaged in this, in this conversation in the way that we, that we are? And the answer is very simple that we cannot solve the problems that um, we seek to address by dealing only with um, affordable housing opportunities within the city of New Haven. Um, one, the applicants on our wait list are coming from all over the state. Um, when we took a, a, a sample of our wait list, we found that a third of our applicants are coming from the surrounding towns right around New Haven. So this is an issue that needs to be solved in the region and can't be solved um, simply in the city of New Haven as it pertains to our housing authority. And a similar conversation can be held at our, our partner uh, agencies across the, across the country. And second, we operate in a system. Uh, the housing system in this country is uh, a system that has probably done more than any other system to create 
and sustain the economic disparities that we see um, today. And the housing um, policy history is rife with examples of racism and discrimination. And we have an obligation to work in a way that is anti-racist to reverse and remedy what has been created. So again, uh, thank you for being able to be a part of this conversation. I'm gonna run through really quickly um, how some housing and schooling um, data points that I wanna raise um, and uh, put that again in the historical context, um, help us think about what we're doing today that's maintaining this and importantly get to our legislative uh, changes. So I'm looking um, at some sample data for New Haven and uh, for, for an urban center using New Haven as example and a suburban center using our friends in Guilford as an example. We could take so many um, uh, comparable uh, suburban urban co uh, comparisons throughout this state and find very similar um, data. But Connecticut's population as a whole, 77% white, 10% uh, um, Black or African American identifying, 13% um, uh, Hispanic Latinx, um, uh, acknowledging that uh, Hispanic and Latinx is not exclusive to, white, to the white or black category. Um, one would expect, um, were things equal and equitable in the state, that you would see similar distributions across urban and suburban uh, communities. But instead, what you see is um, consistently across our suburban communities, overrepresentation of white families in suburban settings and underrepresentation of families of color in, uh, in suburban settings. And you see a concentration of our families of color in our urban settings. When you dig into the, into the housing data, uh, you see New Haven and Guilford being uh, emblematic of what you'll see in pretty much any urban and suburban compar comparison in the state. You see um, highly concentrated rental and multifamily housing in your urban communities. Um, uh, you see your suburban communities uh, overrepresented with single family home ownership, um, underrepresented with, with rental units in general, and certainly well below where they should be in terms of affordable, um, affordable numbers. And when you bring those together, you see that you have white families um, represented in single family home ownership in suburban communities and families of color overrepresented in rental communities in our urban centers. Um, similarly, we see our school demographics um, representing uh, similar congregate segregations of um, urban students being more likely to be um, students of color. Um, school spending, higher uh, numbers in our suburban communities. And you'll note that um, the representation of white students in uh, urban schools is lower than their percentage would be expected by, by the overall population numbers, suggesting that um, the white residents who are living in urban centers tend to not be those who are raising families or that they are making choices to send their children to school in other places. Um, you'll also note that um, Regardless, our students are being taught by teachers who are identifying as white, right? So what does all of this um, mean for us, right? I, we see what we see today as was laid out um, so well by, by Whitney earlier. We see what we have today because of a, a series of decisions that have been made by our government um, over decades that really date back to um, the end of, of slavery, the Emancipation Proclamation, the initial um, amend, passage of amendments, 14th and 15th Amendment that should have granted um, civil rights to everybody, but really took hundreds of years to actually result in practices. Um, and during the practices that could, could uh, begin to protect the rights of families of color. And during that time, the, the um, hundred over 100 year history, we have really cemented a whole host of things that have ensured that Families of color were deprived from the wealth that is uh, generated by uh, homeownership. The families of color were steered into public housing that was then underinvested, segregated and underinvested, um, and, and in uh, urban centers that created no wealth for families, while simultaneously white families were steered into um, government assisted um, homeownership opportunities in suburbs that granted them not just homeownership opportunities, but granted them wealth creation opportunities that have passed from generation to generation. Homes that were underwritten by our federal government in the 40s and 50s in the building of suburban 
um, small Cape style homes that at that time sold for five or $7,000, which in today's dollars would be roughly $75,000, today sell for $350,000, $400,000 in our suburban communities. And that's wealth and equity that has occurred um, for white families that has not occurred for our families of color. And so to work in the public housing sphere that has been so central to the segregation of poverty and segregation by race um, in this country forces us today as housing policy operators to think about the ways in which we can use those same federal programs and, and, in, and in ways that can create equity and wealth for families as opposed to continuing the patterns that we've seen. Um, patterns I don't, don't need to walk us through. I think the, um, the data is very clear on uh, the wealth gap, the home ownership gap um, that we see in our state and across the country. Um, the data is very clear how income uh, has not kept up to pace, uh, growth in income with housing costs, um, and what has resulted in an overall crisis in affordable housing. Uh, if you are interested in further uh, or, or, or want to reference check any of what I've talked about, please, I refer you to Richard Rothstein's um, great summary of this work, The Color of Law, um, and pull this, this quote, as a nation, we've paid an enormous price for avoiding an obligation to remedy the unconstitutional segregation we've allowed to fester. He acknowledges that African Americans have suffered, but also brings our attention to the fact that the nation as a whole and that white families have suffered by this this pattern of segregation that we continue to support. And our actions cannot be neutral in this way. I draw your attention to uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram Kendi, which really centers our work on, we're either gonna be about the work of undoing these racial disparities or continuing them, and that there's really no middle ground. Um, and we're called upon to work in ways that are really anti-racist in this moment. Oops. Uh, just yesterday, Morgan Stanley uh, released a report that was covered in the, in the uh, national media around the ongoing toll that housing discrimination has taken on our economy, uh, the loss of wealth, the loss of tax revenue, the loss of uh, earnings, and I uh, referenced that for you uh, today as well. So this is called us to um, draw together our platform, which we call Inclusive Connecticut. There are many aspects to it, some of, many of which overlap with what Aaron um, has laid out for us, uh, Whitney and Aaron have laid out for us and what Sarah will get into around zoning. So what I really wanna focus on is this aspect around expanding housing authority jurisdiction. Um, what we've done by this uh, pattern of practices is really limit um, the power of housing authorities to use this very rich federal um, benefit, which could be used to get affordable housing into um, every community um, and could be used to do it in a way that would make housing truly affordable for families. And yet in this state, we have limited the authority of housing authorities artificially into um, square, mile, square miles that correspond to municipal um, jurisdiction um, barriers. And what we hope to do through the upcoming session and through our advocacy work is to, to uh, continue this conversation such that the developer who brings the federal dollar that can uh, comes through the voucher program and can make a development truly affordable should be free to be able to use that in any place where there's a development opportunity. And that this in combination with zoning reform and the other things that will be talked about today will actually be bring not just access to communities, but then the ability to build something that will truly be affordable to, uh, to families. Um, so it moves us beyond simply tax credit programs to thinking about tax credit programs that may also have an overlay of voucher programs that again will make something affordable. So I will uh, leave you with my two favorite quotes, the one I'll raise up at the end uh, from, from Maya Angelou. Uh, you do the best you can until you know better. And then when you know better, you do better. I think we know we have a whole uh, amassed body of knowledge around what we've done in the past and what it's created. We know better now and we have an opportunity to do better now. And so with that, I will end and uh, turn it over, I believe, to Sarah, um, <clears throat> who will uh, lay out some of the other aspects that uh, align with our Inclusive Connecticut platform. Thank you. Great. Um, so thank you, Erin, for sharing your screen. I appreciate it. I don't see myself, I see Karen, but um, hopefully you guys can uh, see me at least in part. I've had some technical difficulties today. Um, so I'm gonna go over uh, just a few things So uh, today. So starting with uh, the agenda, 
um, looking at, we're just gonna do a brief introduction. We'll talk about our legislative agenda. Uh, we'll look at data and research, and then we'll talk about next steps. So just in terms of the introduction, um, you know, the, the most important thing to get across is probably the next slide, the definition of zoning. So zoning is the regulation of structures, uses, and lots, and zoning impacts significantly where people live and where they go to school. Uh, looking at exclusionary zoning, so uh, other speakers have focused on this, exclusionary zoning refers to zoning practices that tend to uh, leave out or tend to block certain uh, types of families, certain types of households uh, from a neighborhood. And a lot of times we refer to exclusionary zoning to talk about uh, income exclusion as well as racial exclusion. Um, exclusionary zoning uh, drives up housing costs and it also leads to educational inequity. So there are a number of studies that have been done that, uh, that kind of reveal the ties between zoning, housing costs, and schools and school quality. Uh, so for example, there's a, a, a uh, this slide shows um, a, uh, a congressional report that talks about how uh, the price of home correlates with the quality of schools. Uh, another example is a report that's been done by Brookings. It's great if you haven't seen it. It's linked on our website, desegregatect.org. Um, on housing cost zoning and access. And uh, you know what this, this slide shows is that housing cost, there's, there is a housing cost gap um, in uh, median housing cost between neighborhoods. And this shows that as zoning becomes more restrictive, so this highest quartile of zoning uh, column, uh, the gap in schools widens. And that's particularly the case in Connecticut. Uh, so if you look at the next slide uh, from the same uh, source, uh, you can see two areas, Bridgeport, Stanford, Norwalk, Hartford, West Hartford, East Hartford. If you look at the very right of the, of the box, that red box, you see that, um, that these areas tend to have some of the strictest zoning in the country. So this is, um, a, this is a, a national study that was done and that the school test score gaps in these communities are extremely high. Um, if you go to the next slide, uh, you know, there's another report uh, from the Century Foundation that talks about housing policy being school policy, that's the name of it, and showing once again that, um, that the, the effect of segregating uh, families, seg the, the effect of segregating uh, uh, people by income primarily um, has, has a really uh, negative impact on, on the on education. If you put students in integrated schools, they tend to perform better on both reading and math. And again, I know I'm going through these pretty quickly, but, um, but I just want to give you uh, some hints at what kinds, of, uh, what kinds of connections there are. And by the way, you know, the, the, there's a lot of other impacts of bad land use laws. Um, so racial and economic segregation is one of those. Um, educational opportunities, uh, food and physical insecurity, all of these uh, come together to contribute to inequality. And of course, all of these things are linked. Um, so we've seen in recent news, uh, and uh, Jacqueline talked about it in her keynote uh, just uh, a few moments ago in the last presentation, that Connecticut is attempting to grapple with issues of segregation. And you know, here's a, a picture from Westport, which was discussed in the last, uh, in the last conversation. Um, and there is a group and, and that is starting, and lots of housing groups have worked on these issues for many years. Um, and uh, there's a group that's starting on the next slide um, to try to help to accelerate what they're doing. And it's called Desegregate Connecticut. Um, we consider ourselves a coalition of, of neighbors uh, and nonprofit organizations. And we've come to accept the facts, um, the facts that show that uh, land use laws cause segregation, that segregation exists, um, and that we uh, should do something about it. So the coalition uh, that we've started to form includes lots of different organizations, social justice organizations, the professionals like the architects and the planners um, and preservationists and nonprofit developers and, and sort of others who are taking a broad approach to social justice. And all of us have essentially decided that we, we are working on what the exact proposal will be, but we've all decided that we have to do something about it. And so we're working in tandem. I should also mention too, the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities, uh, which some have thought you know, may, may resist uh, such proposals, but is actually working very actively with us um, to try to reach our goals. 
And our, our overall goals on the next slide um, are really basic. Uh, we want to change statewide land use policy to make it more inclusive by design to, um, to address segregation, uh, to uh, help to improve the economy. We've heard a little bit about that. Um, and then also to protect the environment by building in places that we, um, we know we can build. And so that distills down to these three messages, equity, economy, and the environment. And on the, on the next slide, you'll see just a screenshot of our website, which outlines underneath each of these images, some, some facts behind that. Um, so with that in mind, we can turn to the legislative agenda. We think that statewide reform should address the same key areas um, that uh, were discussed uh, just moments ago. So housing diversity, housing supply, and uh, process improvement. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. We started this summer with a very uh, sketch agenda that um, we called the agenda for the special session. Well, the housing was not on the special session agenda, as you probably know. Um, and uh, what we're doing with those proposals is we're refining them uh, in greater detail to see what it is we should be asking for in uh, when the legislature uh, meets uh, in just a couple of months now. And I'll just go through a few of the ideas so you get a sense of what kinds of things might help to integrate communities uh, in the ways that we know we need to do. So one of them uh, is accessory dwelling units. And these are small units that are uh, included uh, on single family lots uh, that might be uh, located in different areas on a garage on a third floor. Uh, we know that creating accessory dwelling units uh, is something that can be easily done within the existing architectural character of communities. Um, and we know that uh, from our own studies that we've done so far, lots of communities around the state prohibit them, in part because of a link with 830G, which uh, those who uh, uh, know that it adds to the denominator of units. And so there's a reluctance to approve those. And that's one of the things that we're, we've identified and are looking at uh, in our proposals. Uh, the next thing uh, that is middle housing. So middle housing is the range of housing types between two, four units, maybe a little bit more if you look at the slides, uh, the images on the bottom. Uh, but this is really something that uh, is uh, prohibited in many towns across the state, even a duplex or, or a, a townhome. Um, and these are things that we think uh, need to be explored as options for communities to try to um, to try to diversify their, uh, their housing stock in the kinds of households that can locate within particular communities. And again, in, in turn, the kinds of households that can be uh, linked, uh, can, that can access uh, schools. Um, another thing that we've been thinking about is transit-oriented development. So we know that the state and federal governments have made huge investments in transit. Uh, but what we haven't done is uh, developed uh, around those transit uh, investments in ways that make sense. Uh, Brookings just put out a report about Massachusetts and the need there, uh, at very similar state to Connecticut, uh, to zone places around transit to enable the, the middle housing, the two, four, maybe more family housing, um, where people can walk to, walk to trains, um, walk to cluster development, and the environmental impact on that can be very great. Right now, the vast majority of our train stations are zoned for um, for uh, large lot single family zoning, which again, doesn't make sense. We've also been looking at costly parking mandates. Um, so here's just an image, uh, in fact, showing even probably the bare minimum of parking that's required for a, a multi-unit dwelling um, and the mandates that, that, uh, that communities have that make housing unaffordable. And then finally, just last uh, images that I'll show you, uh, we've been advocating for a form-based code uh, to be developed by the state that will help communities uh, pick and choose which kinds of housing that they see in their communities and they can, and then they can replicate it using uh, the form of the building rather than the number of units uh, to try to regulate uh, for architectural character. There's a few other images, uh, a few other ideas too um, that, that are up on our website. Um, process standardization, um, eliminating uh, this concept of character at, as it relates to people, um, replacing that with architectural standards as opposed to um, letting uh, zoning commissions uh, do what they sometimes do, which is uh, equate uh, housing with the character of the people uh, who come in. Um, training land use commissioners, that's something that's very straightforward. Um, capping some town fees and then um, some environmental issues too that might come into the mix. 
um, which uh, are probably too technical to, to discuss here. Um, but that's all to say that we are, are, are thinking about different ideas and what to include in the legislative session. And how are we developing these ideas? A lot of it is through data um, that we've been collecting. So some of you have already seen uh, the statewide zoning code research that we have up on our website. If you click under on, what's well, just I think it's hashtag our data uh, or backslash our data. Uh, we've just done a very a big overview of um, the key metrics within different towns. So for example, how much parking is required um, how much uh, single family uh, minimum lot sizes uh, or, or how much uh, of a minimum lot size is required for single family multifamily housing. And I'd encourage you to look at those so you can see the kind of zoning that, uh, that uh, takes place in different communities. In addition to that zoning, uh, that research, we've done a lot of research on accessory dwelling units. Um, we've looked at other states uh, reforms and we've done, uh, we've embarked on a GIS mapping project uh, which is underway. And if you're a town planner, we will be contacting you to verify your information. Um, but looking at all of the districts in the state across about 50 different characteristics that relate specifically to our proposals so that we can then say, um, okay, you know, this, this is the case in this many towns, it covers this much land across the state and so on. So the next slide just shows you the kind of information we've been collecting on other states reforms, although we do have a page uh, up already about other states. Um, and you can just scroll through the next couple of slides. Uh, these are all on our website uh, showing again, you know, we've also broken down what our current land use laws are. And this is really meant to be a, an educational tool, but also something that advocates can use to, to, to inform, you know, their own uh, the decisions about what they're advocating for. So it's, there's a lot of information there. Um, you know, I guess I should have introduced myself as a law professor. Uh, my, my job is education. And so, you know, part of what we're doing in Desegregate Connecticut is doing a lot of education, a lot of events, um, a lot of uh, public discussions to try to make sure that we're all on the same page for this one specific thing that we're doing, uh, which is statewide advocacy. Um, okay, so in terms of next steps, um, we've thought about what kind of message we need to give to legislators because while many of us are motivated by con the connection between schools and opportunity and um, equity, uh, not everybody thinks uh, that way. And so what we've also been trying to do is to ask our supporters and, and members of our broader community what other issues we think we should uh, advocate for or, or discuss. Um, it seems like the most common one uh, that people think we should emphasize is the economic impact of our proposals. So you'll see more from us about that. And it's not because we don't uh, appreciate e equity, but um, we understand that, that that economic development is a concern uh, that, that might help to bring more people into this uh, discussion about land use reform. So what can you do? Um, action items, you can sign up for our mailing list. You can uh, get your organization to sign on as a partner. It doesn't mean you accept each and every little uh, item that we may put forward, but it does mean that you're part of the broader effort to push for reforms. Um, we have on our mailing list and uh, up on our website, lots of data and reports, um, educate yourself, um, and then finally act. And so, um, you know, we, we've uh, tried with the legislature before, we're gonna go back again, um, you know, you never know. Um, and then here's some other things you can do. And again, this is up on our website, contact your legislator. Uh, we also do have a big page about local efforts uh, in your town. Um, and if you're on our mailing list, you will get uh, some updates about that. And with that, thank you. Um, and uh, we're online and on Twitter and Instagram. So thanks a lot. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you both for sharing all the work that you've been doing. So we're gonna move into a Q&A now. So I see there's some chats already, but feel free to put any other questions in the chat that you would like. And we'll go ahead and Whitney will ask those questions. Um, and if there are no questions, we can go ahead and start with maybe some questions that Whitney and I put together to ask both Karen and Sarah. So do you want to start that, Whitney? Um, so one of the questions that we have are, you know, what are, you guys mentioned, laid out your work so, so thoroughly. Um, what are some of the gaps in the services um, that, you, that you notice? Um, in the housing and education spaces, um, direct services or? 
Well, I think um, you know, the history of, of housing um, policy that I sort of ran through um, was really meant to illustrate how intentional the segregation of, um, of poverty and the limitation of opportunity has been over, over time. And um, we've sort of, um, we, we've done things to create uh, communities that were under-resourced. Um, and then uh, we as a community blame the under-resourced community for uh, not thriving in all the ways that um, intentionally it was set up not to. You know, you go back to the to the earliest zoning um, practices, and you see ways in which um, the um, the areas that were zone, that were determined to be for Black families were also the places where it was acceptable to place the liquor store um, and the bar, and were also the place where it was acceptable to put the industrial uh, waste uh, waste area and the um, industry. Uh, and then when you you know fast forward to the um, the mortgage investment and the redlining, the reasons to redline out a community were um, explicitly um, communities that were had liquor stores and bars and were near industrial um, industrial spaces, right? So we set these things up in ways that have ensured that investment has not happened in places. Um, and then when you couple in, in Connecticut, the way in which public schools are funded um, is so much dependent on what's happening in the, the tax base of that, of that community. Um, we end up with a situation where um, our uh, schools that um, are home to the greatest segregations of, of poverty um, and um, the greatest needs that are associated with educating students who are living in poverty are also those that are most financially challenged. And so I think we see a tremendous amount of gaps in our system around how we think about, um, about um, uh, school, uh, school um placement, school districting, school funding, um, the fact that we are a, a state as tiny as Connecticut and have no sort of regional approach to, to most of these things um, and uh, allow them all to be dictated by 169 unique sort of um, towns and uh, cities and municipalities leads to huge gaps around sort of what is um, the resource base of, um, of, our, of our cities um, and what they're um, asked to do. The other thing I would draw attention to is that um, all of these surrounding towns draw on the resource of the city um, without necessarily contributing. So I think you see that, that um, drain as well where the uh, resources provided for and paid for by the tax base of the city, but benefits the entire region. Um, so I think you see gaps in that way as well. Thank you, Karen. Um, so I think this question is directed towards Sarah. Uh, how is architectural character defined so that it doesn't become a stalking horse for people character? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think um, what we are trying to do is to, to create a, an environment where people are shifting from talking about people to talking about the architecture. So a lot of things that, that we've heard uh, that people say during zoning commission meetings, and I've heard them myself, of course, is that, oh, this, this is not in fitting with the character of the community. Well, I'm a preservationist. I just stepped down as the chair of Preservation Connecticut. And um, the preservationists are, have also looked at this issue and said um, you know, that, that, that compatibility, architectural compatibility really has nothing to do with what's happening inside a, a building. And so thinking about this concept of compatibility, how can you create the middle housing, like the images that we showed, um, in a way that fits within context, but then also how do you change concepts about um, what is accepted or what is an appropriate context? If you look at the historical way that Connecticut developed, we actually developed before zoning in a way that allowed for flexible housing, allowed for people to even uh, have shops in their homes. That's not what we're proposing with Desegregate Connecticut, um, but, but it allowed for, um, and, and, and also I should say dense housing around um, commercial centers and around nodes of transit. What we've done with zoning is we've artificially changed the way that um, people historically in Connecticut actually wanted to live. And actually in a lot of cases, we've even zoned out the way that commercial main streets, our historic main streets develop. So this problem about, uh, about character and, and, and you know, what zoning has wrought on our communities um, it is tied to the fact that the regulatory scheme kind of goes against what, how we would naturally or logically build. Um, and I know another you know, question in this vein is um, that, that I saw in the chat is, 
uh, you know, why are you doing this at, at a statewide level? So using the architectural form, um, you know, uh, concept as, uh, as a way to illustrate this, Connecticut actually has very similar architectural forms across different local governments. Uh, it cost Hartford X amount for us to do our form-based code. Simsbury, Canton, Hamden, other places that have done a form-based code where the zoning code focuses on the architecture have similarly spent a significant sum to do that. Uh, when we know that architectural character uh, should be the thing that communities are concerned about, and when we know that, that Connecticut has a finite set of building types, it seems logical to say, well, the state can play a role here in trying to um, give towns this option of, of developing across, across towns. I mean, but stepping back on that question too, and I'll, I'll finish with this, um, it's completely illogical how we regulate land uh, in the state in general. If we were starting from scratch, we would have never designed a system that allowed each of 169 towns uh, to do different things, even when they were right next to each other. It hinders uh, development, it, it creates, um, a, a, it uh, distorts the market, um, and of course, as we know, it, it really impacts equity. So I think all of these questions are related, but we want to help um, everybody see that if we level the playing field and if we uh, have a few basic principles uh, that everybody's playing with, uh, that would actually be much better for the state um, for a lot of different reasons. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, so yeah, address the statewide versus local level city efforts. Um, and there's a question, uh, has anyone used or researched naturally occurring affordable housing? And if so, have you found any difficulties acquiring it? So um, naturally occurring affordable housing is absolutely a, a, a piece of the, um, of the pie here in, in terms of solutions. Um, you know, and I think just as you know, as we look at, there were a whole host of actions that led to the system that we see today and the, the situation we see today. And it's going to take a whole host of actions, I think, to move us out of this. There's no one um, silver bullet. It's it's why you know it's uh, great if you if you if you jump on the, the desegregate um, uh, CT website or you look at the the Connecticut Voices report or you look at what we're what we're putting out. Um, there are a lot of pieces um, to, um, to address to try to remedy the situation. Um, I think it's important though that we keep our, our focus on the fact that government had a huge role in getting us there. And so government's gonna have a huge role in, in moving us out of there. Um, but that government alone is not, is not the player here, right? There were a whole lot of private actions that happened as well. So naturally occur occurring affordable housing happens in, um, in lots of our communities where there are things that just naturally are renting at a, at a rate. I think that that are affordable to families. I think there are a whole host of things that could be done to um, support those um, often small uh, mom and pop landlords um, to be able to invest in their property to keep it at the highest um, at the highest quality, so that it is also it's naturally occurring, but also something that that meets the kinds of standards that we would want for for uh, families. Um, I think there's absolutely. Um, public-private um, uh, governmental partnerships that can happen to support those kinds of efforts. Um, and we, you know, we, I, I talk so uh, often about the federal subsidy that we, that we use, but the federal subsidy um, that's used to subsidize low-income families is far uh, insufficient for, for the need out there. And so even in the things we're exploring, we're looking at things that we can do without um, the uh, overlay of federal subsidy and, and ways in which we might acquire things that we can keep into the market, uh, in, in, invest in, improve, and keep in the market at a, at a naturally um, uh, low, uh, low or rental point um, that, will, that will help to uh, create more opportunities beyond what the uh, subsidized amounts can. Great. Can I just emphasize something that Karen just said, which is that there are lots of different solutions and, and so many different policy areas that uh, need to be addressed in order to get us to that goal. So, you know, our group is only looking at zoning and maybe a, a few auxiliary issues related to land use, but, but there's a, there's so many issues, home ownership subsidies. I mean, there's, there's so many things that, that we need to do um, to, to really make a significant change. You know, a, a huge thing that just that, that everybody can play a part in is looking around the places and spaces that um, that individuals are, are living, are, are, are frequenting and seeing who's there and seeing who's not there and being a voice for, for greater inclusion. Um, you know, um, the, the reality is that, um, that 
the, the folks that tur turn out, even for the most contentious um, uh, sort of zoning uh, hearing in a town, are a very small percentage of the town, town population. And the reality is that, that most folks don't show up and we have no idea what their, um, what their position is on it. And if you are one of those voices who wanna create greater um, opportunity in our suburban towns, if you're a voice that wants to be um, pushing for more diversity in the, in the community, um, for the benefit of all in the community, then there are uh, so many ways to, to raise your voice and let, let your voice and your, your thoughts be known around those. Yeah, and we just, I'm putting this in the chat. We just did a, a, a page about this exact topic, how to comment at public hearings. I would encourage you yep. to get involved, see what, what's happening in your town and, um, and oh, whoops, that should be .org instead of .let. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> um, I think we only have time for one more question. And the, well, I'll try, to, I'll try to combine these two because they both relate to home ownership. Um, but uh, one question said, is home, is home ownership a good approach to integrate affordable housing in the suburbs? Can housing vouchers be used towards home ownership? Um, and then we have a other question. Um, beyond changing public policy, how do we change, how do we help people buy homes, particularly undocumented people? Yes, yes, yes. Home ownership is absolutely a, a part of this, and it's a part of the you know greater greater investment in, in helping people get into home ownership is a part of our platform as well. Um, the reality is the way in which um, wealth has been blocked that there's a the the there is a absolute pathway into suburban communities that has to be around rental housing because of the income and wealth disparities that we've seen. There needs to be also pathways into home ownership. The connection to what Sarah bringing up this missing middle. Um, is important. There need to be opportunities to get into um, suburban communities in starter homes. Um, folks aren't building starter homes um, as, as much anymore, right? And um, not everybody's going to go from rental to the four bedroom um, uh, single family home in, uh, in Guilford. So we need to have a pathway into that. Um, and then just the, the, you know, think about remedy or reparations, however you want to think about it. The fact that, um, that this wealth, this greatest wealth accumulating um, tool in the United States, which is home ownership, was intentionally blocked from communities, means that we need to do something to address not just letting them get into home ownership, but letting them get into home ownership at the at the at the value that they that they should have been able to get into it when they were blocked, yet with the equity that they should have accrued by by today. And so there, there are ways to to think about that. The voucher program is absolutely one we support um, uh, a whole host of families through our um, home ownership program and each um, housing authority has the ability to do home ownership with the voucher um, platform. And it is certainly one way to get families into subsidized um, home, on home ownership. Great, great. Thank you so much. Well, I want to give a big thank you to our speakers today. Um, uh, they'll also have contact information for you all available on slides. Please take advantage of the resources that Karen and Sarah and Aaron have shared in the chat. We encourage you to stay involved um, and thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thanks for including thank us. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you, you everyone. Absolutely.